We are so keen about emphasizing what is making us different from others uh, because we perhaps have forgotten the sense of our unity in Jesus, that it is easy to turn that mindset upon one another and upon ourselves and then begin to destroy ourselves internally. Our lack of consciousness of spiritual unity with all Christians may be part of the roots of how we deal with one another in our church as well. Welcome back to Advent Next, a theological podcast curated for curious faith discussions. Welcome to part two of our talk with Dr. Denny Forten on ecumenism, or basically, you know, how do we find unity among the various denominations and churches? How cautious should we be in our journey towards unity? And maybe some of our fears are not really founded. So what ways can we begin to work with other churches in a way that is not highlighting the differences, but coming together on the points that we can agree? Uh, Stay tuned for this episode. I really think that you're going to like it. If you're not already following us on Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube, be sure to do so at Advent Next. And you can follow me at Kendra Arsenal with an X. But right now, this is Advent Next. I'm curious, you know, if, do you think that if Adventism would adopt more of this kind of, you know, maybe not a a systematized ecumenism, but like just this collective sense of oneness and unity, do you think that our, the way that we think about uh, ecumenism affects the way that we deal with each other internally? You know, because it seems like ecumenism requires there to be this understanding of diversity within unity. And do you think that maybe our ideas about that affects how we relate to one another within our own denomination? Wow. Uh, Yes. Yes, by all means. Uh, I I agree with you. And I've said that before. And uh, the fact that we get into our own internal political wars over points of doctrines, whatever the doctrine may be, ordination of women, ordination period, uh, nature of Christ, a role of the Holy Spirit, uh, health reform, should you be vegan or not, and on and on and on. The way we treat each other within our denomination, and sometimes within the same conferences, some churches branding themselves as more faithful to Adventism than another church in, in the next town over because they've become too liberal. You know, this kind of conversation in Adventism uh, is happening uh, because we perhaps have forgotten the sense of our unity in Jesus. Mm. We're so keen about emphasizing what is making us different from others that it is easy to turn that mindset upon one another and upon ourselves and then begin to destroy ourselves internally. That was the problem in 1 Corinthians. The schisms between, oh, you say you are of Apollos and you are of Cephas. Oh, no, those some of you, you are of Jesus. I mean, you're the best ones. That was the problem in 1 Corinthians that Paul was addressing. And it was forgetting that unity we have in Jesus. Yes, mm-hmm. uh, you're right to say um, that our lack of consciousness of spiritual unity with all Christians may be part of the roots of how we deal with one another in our church as well. I I, I just, I'm thinking about it because it's like, you know, we cut the line so close sometimes to what it means to be Adventism and, or what it means to be Adventist and are you in, are you out? And I just wonder if there would be a broader sense or broader love if there was a practice of, uh, of, of a unity and mindset. And To follow up with that, like on a kind of devil's advocate and playing on the other side, is there a point where unity becomes dangerous? Like, can you become so unified to the point that maybe you're in spiritual danger or, or is that just a fear that we have that's not really a reality? If you are convinced on, on the basis of your reading of scripture, that some doctrines, beliefs, are valid, they're good, and they're based on scripture, and they're what defines you. There is no amount of unity in Jesus that is going to damage that. 
that is going to undermine that. Um, it may help you perhaps see things in better perspective. And there are some key elements of Christian faith that should perhaps have priority over some other elements of Christian faith. And that has been part of the debates, you know, for generations and for centuries. Yes, but never should it be undermined that there is that spiritual unity in Christ. Yet, I we know we need to affirm, we need to be convinced of of who we are and, and, and why we exist and and why we are uh, as a people, as a denomination. We have some great things to offer to the Christian world. Things that were forgotten through the centuries, uh, undermined or simply put aside. Uh, believes in uh, the Sabbath, for example, the observance of the commandments of God. Most Christians will agree that we should keep the commandments of God. But how to do it and to what extent, you know, there's all kinds of ups and downs about this. Well, we, we have something to bring to the conversation when it comes to observing the commandments of God and why that's important. Uh, how many people nowadays, you know, talk about the benefits of having a day of rest and of observing Sabbath, uh, the seventh day of the week? Yes, a lot of people want to transfer it perhaps to Wednesday uh, during the week because that's the day I'm off. Be that as it may, God has said, you know, every seven day on the seventh day is, is a day of, of Sabbath, a day of rest. How much we have to offer to the world that this is something that God had in mind all the way since creation. Uh, how about, you know, this, this unnerving, uh, exasperating hope we have that one day there's going to be a better world a and that Jesus is going to come, that God is going to intervene into the, uh, into the history of this world and is going to recreate this world anew. I mean, mm. uh, Seventh-day Adventists should present to other Christians, you know, th th this hope, this boundless hope that there is going to be a new world one day. We should not be ashamed. There's nothing to be ashamed about this, that there is going to be hope. And I can have all kinds of conversations with other Christians, believing that there is this unity we have in Jesus. And yet, you know, I, I may have these beautiful moments once in a while where I can talk about the commandments of God. I can talk about this hope. I can talk about the benefits of taking care of my body being careful with, you know, smoking, drinking, food, meat, you know, vegetarianism, and so on. Yeah, you, you've got all kinds of things. We have all kinds of things that we can share with the rest of the Christian world from a positive perspective. Instead yeah. of denigrating other Christians for what they don't believe like me, let me tell you what I believe and why I believe it, and why I think there's something to be thought and something to be gained uh, by what we as Seventh-day Adventists contribute to the Christian world, things that have been forgotten through the centuries. Now, I, I just wonder, like, if, if, if kind of our, our attitude, um, you know, uh, towards unity really might stem from, like, this almost trauma response from this commission to evangelize. And what I mean by is, like, sometimes we can see evangelism as, like, very utilitarian in a sense of if you're not contributing to the numbers of those who I am saving, uh, then it's not worth my time, right? Or, or, that, or that, you know, God is not pleased with me spending my time here. And I wonder if maybe our relationship with, you know, and sitting with the differences of other denominations, and I don't know, I'm just putting this out there, is stemming from the sense of like, you're not being evangelized because often there's a, you know, if you're sitting with a, a Catholic or a Protestant, there is someone who's Adventist might feel the urge to say, tell them about the Sabbath or tell them about the beast of revelation, right? Like, and there might be this temptation to, to evangelize them. And then if they don't evangelize to our unique position, it's, it's a lost cause. And maybe we should move on to the next. Is that, you know, like, is, do you find that to be true? And how do we navigate this desire to want to evangelize other Christians to our unique position? And is there space to, is God okay with them staying how they are? I'm going to be radical here. <laughs> okay. We don't need to evangelize other Christians if they already have a, a relationship with Christ. Because evangelization, evangelism is, is communicating the gospel to others. So if the people with whom I'm having a conversation are church-believing Christians who have a relationship with God, I don't need to evangelize them. They are already evangelized. 
they already know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. I, I hope you understand the perspective I'm bringing here. It does not mean, however, that their relationship with God cannot improve, that, that my relationship with God cannot improve. Of course, that relationship with God can improve. Would it improve, I asked myself, if they knew about the Sabbath, if they knew about the second coming of Jesus, if they knew a little bit more about the fact that Jesus is currently their intercessor in heaven and mediates for them, would their relationship with God be improved a little bit more if they knew that? Well, yes, of course. I, I can ask myself that in a gentle way. Perhaps I can bring the conversation in that direction to see if they would be receptive to that. But I don't need to convert them if they already have a relationship with God. I want to help them have a better one with God. And you know what? Maybe they would say the same thing about me, that if they shared some of their things with me, maybe I would have a better relationship with God. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But uh, yes, I think too often we look at evangelism as being very much of an institutional thing. It's a, num it's a numbers game. It's a number of baptisms, it's a number of attendees at conferences and evangelistic meetings. Uh, it's a numbers game. And the more my number is high, you know, the better I will be perceived in my conference and so on. And yeah. I think we've got that wrong. And mm -hmm. I think we're putting an emphasis perhaps where God is not asking that kind of an emphasis. Mm -hmm. um, God is interested in people, not in numbers. And, and our evangelism should be focused, I, I think, uh, should, should keep in mind these basic relationships that we have with other Christians to start with. And we should approach them and the sharing with them of our distinctive message in a way that keeps that in mind. Instead of doing an us and them, we are in this together. Here's what I'd like to share with you. Mm -hmm. And... and how often have I had that experience with Christians of other denominations, scholars of other denominations, who themselves brought up the subject of the Sabbath and wanted me to share with them, what is this thing about the Sabbath? Or why are you a vegetarian? And, and why are you having this kind of a lifestyle? You know, talk to me about this a little bit more. Yes. And it was in a very generous and very very uh, very good and positive context yeah I, I love this and and I think that I mean I have so many good friends in different denominations and from every single one of them I can think of these beautiful you know pictures of God that I receive from them and uh, we have a genuine friendship and it's and I don't feel the need to say you know like uh, you didn't convert to the Sabbath, then like, you know, we can't be friends anymore because you're rejecting truth, right? Like, and I think too often we might um, put place ourselves in the position of being the judge and thinking that we told them and they rejected it. And so God rejects them. And it just might be like, God is, God is dealing with people according to their own conscience. If their conscience is not convicted, you know, then he's not going to judge them based off of something that they're not even convicted or convinced of. And, and I, I, so I, I love the conversation that, that we're bringing together about ecumenism. Um, as we kind of wrap down, maybe the next couple of questions, just talk to us a little bit about, you know, uh, your experience uh, in the conversation with ecumenism and anything that you would want us to know? Oh, my. Uh, well, let me share perhaps a little bit of my own testimony with this. Mm -hmm. uh, many years ago, uh, late 1990s, I was asked by the, uh, by the church to uh, present uh, some Adventist perspectives at a National Council of Churches uh, Commission on Faith and Order uh, here in the United States. And uh, thereafter, I, I joined that commission. I was invited to join the Commission on Faith and Order of the National Council of Churches. And for about 13, 14 years, I was a member of that commission and had the privilege, really, of rubbing shoulders with uh, scholars, pastors of various denominations to talk about various topics 
And I was the only Adventist there uh, sharing uh, very often my own point of view uh, on, on these issues that we were talking about, but also uh, the ad hoc personal friendship meetings that would happen uh, around the supper table or the breakfast table. And they would ask a question about this and a question about that. And uh, you, know, you, you had some very interesting moments there uh, with some of these colleagues. I have remained friends with many of them. Uh, I have not been on the commission for about 10, 12 years now, but I've been, uh, you know, uh, no less than that, uh, about uh, about seven years. And and uh, I still remain friends with some of them. Some of them I see uh, at the annual professional meetings we have uh, of professors of, uh, of uh, religion and theology every November. And, and it's fun, it's fun to have these, uh, these meetings with them. Uh, how many times also have I heard them say in a more official way, why aren't you Seventh-day Adventists part of this council or that council? Because you bring a perspective on Christianity that none of us have. You mm. keep the Sabbath, you have a health message, you've got a wide, extensive educational system, hospital system, uh, you uh, you see things and you perceive things in a particular way because of your beliefs. And so therefore your voice, your Christian voice is not being heard in our councils because there's none of us like you in our mm. councils. We need you to be part of our councils. And of course, our official line of response to that has always been we will not be part of an ecumenical council or a national council of some kind. Uh, although that's not true. The Seventh-day Adventist Church in many European countries is a member of the local national council of churches in those countries. Mm. Uh, there are 40 some European countries, and I think we must be part of at least 20 or so European kinds of national councils uh, in these European countries. We may not be here in Canada and the United States, but in many other parts of the world, we are a part of these councils and we do bring a voice of, mm. of, of contribution to what Christianity is about and, and some aspects of Christianity that have been neglected and forgotten. And that are, I think, certainly I believe to be very relevant to the Christian world. So it's not all negative. The ecumenical movement is not all negative. There are plenty of people in these ecumenical councils who would love to hear what Seventh-day Adventists have to say mm. on social issues, on theological issues, um, on environmental, ecological issues, mm. uh, you name it. You know, they would love to hear what we have to say. Now, I was just wondering, like, what, what would it take for us to to enter into something like that, like it, it's see if if they are wanting to hear from us and enter into brotherhood and fellowship, what would, what do you think is missing on our part, and when would we might be willing to enter into something like that? I think there's plenty of Seventh Day Adventists in North America who would see the benefit of being parts of some of these councils, either regional councils or even the National Council of Churches. But because of a tradition we have within our church by now of having branded anything ecumenical as being of the devil, I'm being very candid here. Therefore, any move on the part of any of our church officers, uh, whether it, at the North American division or uh, some of the unions in North America or even at the general conference, any, any movement on their part to show a willingness to be part of some of these councils immediately is branded as being of the devil. And therefore the, the pushback is so strong that people just want to leave it alone and, and not really discuss it or, or being part of it. I think that's my feeling of what is happening. Uh, I think many church leaders understand the benefits that we would be able to provide, and it would be a form of witness of our faith to other Christians of other denominations, but very often the leaders 
of these other denominations. Mm. Um, but because of pushbacks and because of the animosity that this would generate, uh, we basically are, are not joining any of these councils. And those of us that do, uh, we tend to do it incognito, under the table, behind the scenes, uh, and so on. And uh, hopefully not too many people know about it. Otherwise, people get branded and get demonized. Mm. Very unfortunate. It's a very, very unfortunate situation. Um, again, because of the experience I've had and, and the positiveness of people really wanting to hear the Seventh-day Adventist voice. And I think we're no longer, you know, uh, I say in class sometimes, we're no longer a pokey donk little denomination that nobody knows about. Yeah. We are a big denomination. We're a worldwide denomination. We've got about 30 million members. If you include the friends and the children, we're 35, 40 million people. Even those who are no longer really part of the fellowship still call themselves Adventists of some kind. You know, we're a, a fairly large group in some countries, we are a, a large segment of the population, 5 to 10, 15%, perhaps even a little bit more, Malawi, Nigeria, uh, Kenya, uh, some islands of the uh, Caribbean. You now we're a large segment of the population. Uh, some Seventh-day Adventists are in positions of, of social uh, government leaderships, ministers, judges, prime ministers. Uh, we've had a few that have been uh, governor general uh, of the Commonwealth of some of the islands of the Caribbean, even current, currently the governor general of Jamaica is a Seventh-day Adventist, uh, mm. uh, Alan, and, uh, and so on. Um, we're no longer a little pokey dunk denomination. People yeah. have noticed us. People know us. They know, you know, the good things we do. And they wonder why there's this hesitation to be part of these Christian forums, of these Christian councils, the Christian fellowships. There's all kinds of words that are being used to describe these ecumenical activities. And I, I wonder as well, I, 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 maybe times will change. Maybe a podcast like this one, making people a little bit more aware of some of the positive things that could come out of it. Maybe over time, things will change. As, as, so what would be like a, a kind of a word of encouragement or anything else that you'd want to share, a word of insight or admonition that you'd want to leave our listeners with today? Well, it, within the context of the conversation we've had, Kendra, I would say perhaps two things. First of all, uh, be conscious, remember that in Christ, uh, we are all united, that there's a, a form of unity of some kind between all of us in Jesus. That should never be forgotten. That, that is a basic principle of Christianity, uh, not of the ecumenical movement alone, of Christianity. This is a basic principle of Christianity. And we are Christians, so that, that's one of our principles as well. Second, on a very, very practical basis, if you are a pastor of a local congregation somewhere in North America, and if in your community there is some kind of a pastoral association, pastors of all denominations who meet together perhaps once a month for breakfast at a little cafe restaurant, and you spend an hour or so or two just to talk and to chit chat, to get to know each other, I would say join those ministerial fellowships. Uh, get acquainted with the other pastors in your community. Do it on the basis of love of Jesus and, and share who you are. They'll pray for you and you'll pray for them and, and create some bonds of fellowship. And who knows, if a disaster hits your community, these bonds of friendship are very important. And uh, if something disaster happens to you and your community, your Adventist community, you'll see these other Christians come to the rescue and, and to help us. And that is good. That, that would be a very practical thing to do. Don't be fearful. Don't be afraid. Just uh, share, share uh, who you are as a human being and, and as a love, uh, as the love of God, you know, motivates you to do this. Two very simple things, one biblical, 
and then one practical. Mm, thank you so much. And, and just uh, if anybody wants to learn more about this, do you have any book recommendations that somebody could check out? Um, and even if you don't have it at the top of your head, you can send them in an email to me. But anything that comes to mind at the moment? Well, there's one I could share. Um, back in the fall of 2019, 2018, uh, we had a Sabbath school quarterly on oneness in Christ. I wrote this Sabbath school quarterly, but I was the principal author. I did not write all of it because there was a lot of editing done to the manuscript, but I was the principal author. And also there was a companion volume that came along as well, one in Christ, uh, Biblical Principles for a Doctrine of Church Unity. I would recommend those two. So dig them up. Uh, the Sabbath school quarterly is certainly online. You can find it as a PDF uh, at the General Conference uh, website. Uh, the other little book, the companion volume, One in Christ, uh, that one is probably out of print by now, but you could probably find a few copies uh, somewhere uh, on the ABC uh, website or Amazon. Thanks so much for tuning in. I really hope that you enjoyed this two-part series on ecumenism and that maybe you were challenged, maybe it helped to grow out your faith in some way. So I really appreciate you guys who are listening in and tracking with me every week. I appreciate your listener support and I look forward to bringing you more creative and cool episodes in the future. So stay tuned and see you next week.